like to disclose that there is no conflict of interest regarding this talk. I'll be talking about management of a massive blood loss in neurosurgery in the next 20 minutes. Massive blood loss and massive transfusions are quite common in neurosurgery because of the various factors. The brain is a very highly vascular organ. It receives about 750 ml of blood per minute and cerebral cortex has a very high content of tissue thromboplastin. Because of this, any injury, a tissue or neuronal injury, which releases tissue thromboplastin, which can trigger the extrinsic clotting pathway, which can lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation, ultimately causes conception coagulopathy. Some tumors, especially the meningioma, shown to produce tissue plasminogen activator, which converts the plasminogen to plasmin, which leads to significant hyperfibrinolysis. Not only this plasmin leads to hyperfibrinolysis, but also it actually induces a thrombin generation and it can cause cleavage of fibrinogen to fibrin. Also, it causes cleavage of receptors and platelets. Ultimately, all of these factors which leads to DIC and conception coagulopathy. Some of the brain pathologies are highly vascular. That also can lead to uh, massive blood loss. And when we see that, uh, uh, you know, achieving hemostasis during brain surgery is a very challenging task as packing or application of ligatures or suturing is not possible in neurosurgical setup, it can lead to prolonged hemostasis that also will lead to massive blood loss. Till now, we have seen the factors which are um, causes more blood loss in neurosurgery. Apart from that, there are various other reasons which are common to all other major surgeries, which can also lead to massive blood loss, especially when there is an unexpected blood loss, which will get treated with excessive crystalloid and colloid during the initial resuscitation phase, that can lead to hemodilution and dilutional coagulopathy. Also, rapid administration of cold blood and IV fluid can lead to hypothermia, which can lead to acute platelet dysfunction. Not only it causes that, it also decreases the coagulation factor synthesis from the liver, and also it decreases the activity of uh, clotting factors, whatever is available in the blood. Then, hence, it leads to coagulopathy. Massive blood loss causes a tissue hypoperfusion and acidosis. Acidosis will worsen the coagulopathy by inactivating all the clotting factors. Surgery itself can produce fibrinolytic, fibrinogenolytic, and inflammatory pathway activation, which also leads to worsening of coagulopathy. Some patients, when they come for emergency surgery, they will be on antiplatelets and anticoagulant medication. This will lead to ma massive blood loss. So this is a flow chart. Whatever I have have uh, discussed till now, it is just a uh, diagrammatic representation of the uh, pathogenesis of hemostatic abnormality that happens in neurosurgery. Whenever the uh, blood loss which happens in the confined intracranial space and intra uh, into the spinal cord, which can lead to many devastating complications. Hence, meticulous hemostasis and appropriate management of excessive blood loss is very crucial for the successful functional outcome. Whenever we manage patients with a massive hemorrhage, uh, there are the certain principles to be followed. Thorough preoperative evaluation, preoperative prediction and preparation, early administration of antifibrinolytic, maintenance of tissue perfusion and oxygenation, maintenance of normothermia and ionic calcium, utilization of all possible blood conservation strategies, including patient blood management protocol, and early activation of uh, MTP protocol, massive transfusion protocol in selective cases, and early identification of transfusion-induced complications and its management are essential from anesthetic point of view. And from the surgical uh, factors like proper positioning, meticulous surgical technique, and appropriate use of chemical hemostatic agents to control the ble bleeding is essential while managing the massive hemorrhage. Apart from this general principle, the specific principles of re reduction in ICP, maintenance of CPP, and adequate brain relaxation is the key factor for successful outcome. When we talk about massive blood loss, everyone needs to know about massive transfusion. There are, uh, whenever we transfuse blood large in a large volume over a short period of uh, time, it is called massive transfusion. There are different definitions for adult and children. When it comes to adult, when we transfuse more than 10 packed red blood cells within 24 hours, or transfusion of more than four packed red cells within an hour, when there is an ongoing bleeding is happening, or whenever we replace more than 50% of the total blood volume 
within three hours, it is considered as massive transfusion in adults. When we calculate the total blood volume estimation in adults, we follow Gilcher's rule of five. So when we consider for a normal patients, we take a 65 ml per kilo as a total blood volume for female and 70 ml per kilo for adult male. When it comes to obese individual, we take 55 ml per kilo for female and 60 ml per kilo for male. And there are different definitions uh, of massive transfusion in children. When we transfuse more than 100% of the total blood volume within 24 hours, or when we transfuse more than 10% of the total blood volume per minute in a, a children who are under, uh, having an ongoing hemorrhage, or replacement of more than 50% of the total blood volume with blood and blood products within three hours. Um, now, when we calculate the total blood volume estimation in pediatrics, it depends upon the neonate, uh, patient's age and the body weight. When, when we talk about uh, neonate and infant less than 10 kilo, we take it as 85 ml per kilo. For younger children less than 25 kilo, it's 75 ml per kilo. We uh, More than 25 kilos for older children, more than 25 kilo, we take it as 70 ml per kilo. Uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists have released an updated report on practice guidelines for perioperative blood management, which has been released in Anesthesiology 2015, and in which they have actually uh, 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 quoted there are five steps in managing the uh, patients with the uh, who are expecting to have a high um, massive bleeding. Uh, it starts with patient evaluation, pre-admission preparation, and pre-procedure preparation, and intraoperative management, and post-operative intervention. Now we will go through each of this in detail. Uh, when we come talk about pre-operative patient evaluation, we do uh, conduct the patient interview and review the medical records and go through the, all the blood investigations, including hemoglobin and coagulation profile. In some patients, we may need to do factor assay where the coagulation profiles, PTA, PTT are borderline, and typing and cross-matching is a must. And in patients who definitely is going to have a massive bleeding, sometimes we need to order maximum surgical blood ordering technique needs to be followed. Uh, we have a preoperatively evaluated. Now we need to predict them which patients are more prone for um, transfusion. Now that is there are some general predictors that depends upon the type of surgery, what is the baseline hemoglobin, what are the comorbidities the patient has, what is the allowable blood loss for him, what is the transfusion trigger, are you going to use liberal transfusion strategy or restrictive strategies, and what is the type of the tumor, where is it located, what is the vascularity of the tumor, all those things will predict your transfusion. Now we will move on to some evidence-based um, uh, evidence for these. And this is a paper which is published uh, from the AIMS group, and they have looked at the various risk factors for massive transfusion in patients undergoing an elective brain tumor surgery. They have looked at only in um, adult patients, and they have uh, uh, predicted that the female patients who are hypertensive, tumor size up more than 5 cm, and with the mass effect and midline shift, and high-grade gliomas and meningiomas, uh, uh, they have a high vascular of preoperative imaging, they are actually more prone for massive bleeding. And uh, uh, patients, uh, some of the intraoperative factors are extended craniotomy, colloid use of more than 1000 ml, and intraoperative brain bulge and duration of surgery more than 300 minutes is considered as a risk factor for massive blood loss. This is a paper published from Japan, and they have looked at the um, uh, risk factors for massive bleeding in skull based surgery, and they have predicted that the extent of tumor invasion and duration of surgery predicted the most. And this is another paper published in Journal of Neurosurgical Anesthesiology where they have looked at the spine surgery and the risk factor for massive transfusion. And they have predicted that there are four factors. One is duration of surgery, number of posterior level instrumented, instrumented and surgical complexity scoring and preoperative hemoglobin are the main predictors of um, transfusion. Here we have performed a retrospective study from 2012 to 2015 where we have looked at the various factors and we have predicted the tumor size of more than five centimeters, prolonged duration, and uh, meningioma and spine surgeries are the common risk factors for the massive transfusion. This is the recent um, 
review uh, uh, published by Dr. Gleb and uh, Dr. Flaxman, and uh, they have actually subgrouped each of uh, neurosurgical procedures and the various risk factors for transfusion. For example, traumatic brain injury patients comes with a traumatic coagulopathy and the transfusion risk is very high. Where, for example, if the patient comes for cranio, uh, pediatric craniosynostrosis surgery, if they are syndromic or if there is a pansynostrosis involvement or if their age is less than 18 months or with their body weight is less than 10 kilo and surgical duration of more than five hours are the uh, risk factors for massive transfusion. And now we have actually predicted which patient in elective surgery, spine surgery, tumor surgery, and pediatric patients, everything we have seen. Now we are moving on to trauma. There are in trauma, because of this uh, associated comorbidities and pre-injury medications and uh, the shock they present with and trauma associated factors, resuscit uh, resuscitation associated factors, all those things can lead to traumatic coagulopathy. Hence, there are certain predictive scores uh, that tells you that these patients need a massive transfusion. And uh, there are various scores. I uh, highlight only certain important scores. And one is trauma-associated severe hemorrhage, TAR score. This is a, the German group has published this. They utilizes various clinical and laboratory variables. And they have actually come up with a TAR score of more than 16 points. That means the probability of massive transfusion is 50. And TAR score of more than 27 points, the risk of massive transfusion is 100%. There is an, another score called blood consumption score. It's a called ABC score of blood transfusion, which has a four component. If the two co score component is there, then there is a um, trigger for um, initiating the massive transfusion protocol. There is another course called MTP score, massive transfusion protocol score. There is another score for dynamic massive blood transfusion that is also utilizes various clinical factors and uh, val uh, lab values, which tells us that uh, massive transfusion risk is high or the mortalities also can be predicted using this score. Now we have preoperatively evaluated and predicted. Now we have to utilize what all the preoperative blood conservation strategies can be used to reduce the blood loss and uh, blood transfusion. Now we will move on to each of this. What are the preoperative strategies, intraoperative and postoperative strategies can be used in neurosurgical patients. Correction of coagulopathy, correction of iron deficiency anemia, and administration of erythropoietin, and preoperative autologous donation, and preoperative embolization are some of the preoperative strategies can be utilized to decrease the blood loss and massive transfusion. Some of the intraoperative factors are correction of coagulopathy, utilization of acute normolemic hemodilution or acute hypervolemic hemodilution, or continuous hemoglobin monitoring, intraoperative cell salvage, use of anti fibrinolytic agent as early as possible, avoiding in NSAIDs and uh, starch solutions and the um, utilization of controlled hypotension, proper positioning, use of chemical hemostatic agents um, at the local site. All these things are intraoperative blood conservation strategies we can use to reduce the blood loss and blood transfusion. And what are the post-operative post strategies we can follow? Correction of coagulopathy, avoidance of NSAID and starch, and post-operative blood recovery. Now we will uh, move on to the evidence. Uh, where is the evidence? Now this is a paper published in Canadian Journal of Neurological Sciences where the surgeons have looked at the erythropoietin and the preoperative autologous donation on uh, allogenic transfusion. They have predicted that preoperative autologous donation is associated with increased incidence of preoperative anemia and does not increase the incidence of allogenic transfusion. And preoperative autologous donation is increased the transfusion requirement. So uh, because of this reason, it is not, this technique is not utilized very effectively in neurosurgical setup. And this is the paper published by Dr. Anna Flexman and Dr. Um, in 2018 in BJA, they have actually looked at various and intraoperative, perioperative uh, blood conservation strategies, and which is utilized for intracranial neurosurgeries. These are the following eight uh, techniques has been utilized in neurosurgery, and we will see what is the evidence. The reversal of coagulopathy is practiced more in ICH patients, and it is shown that 50% risk reduction in hematoma expansion, and with the reversal, the INR came down one, uh, to one point three, less than 1.3. And use of anti-fibrinolytic therapy, which has been used in based tumor, craniosynostosis, and TBI and subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's shown to reduce the blood loss and blood transfusion significantly. But uh, in SAH patients, it's also reduced the re-rupture, but uh, there is an incidence of cerebral ischemia has increased with the use of 
anti fibrinolytic agents and what about uh, administration of erythropoietin uh, actually it definitely increase the hemoglobin but there is uh, conflicting evidence in tbi because there is a uh, increased incidence of uh, risk of thromboembolism and avoidance of NSAIDs and uh, uh, start solutions which decrease the perioperative uh, um, hematoma size and uh, utilization of ANH definitely decreases the uh, um, allogenic transfusion whenever the hemoglobin is more than 12 grams per deciliter it is this procedure is recommended and dropping the hematocrit to 20 to 25 is um, done usually during this procedure and we have already seen this preoperative autologization and what about cell salvage it is recommended only in certain benign vascular tumor and ruptured cerebral aneurysm. Um, so, but when we use a chemical hemostatic agent, it is very important to um, not to use this technique. And what about continuous uh, serial hemoglobin monitoring, which reduced the amount of unit transfuse and also it helped in early transfusion. What about preoperative embolization? This technique is being utilized more for children, not for adults, because in many literature says that it's a conflicting event. Some so, so there is a uh, uh, blood loss and blood transfusion is minimal. Some are actually very difficult to achieve hemostasis in those patients. And also they have shown that the complete resection was not possible with this technique. And because we have, we also have to keep it in mind because they are actually giving contrast induced diuresis is happening. So they are hypovolemic to start with. So very important we have to resuscitate them before the bleeding happens. Otherwise they are more prone for embolization. Um, air embolism. And, uh, and another thing is peritumoral edema following an uh, embolization can cause tight brain. So we may need to give extra dose of manitol that makes the patient so hypovolemic. And also um, this uh, tight brain can cause release of uh, tissue thromboplastin. Hence, uh, we have to be careful that can ag actually aggravate the bleeding. And what about role of permissive hypotension in neurosurgery? It is actually this, uh, the role of permissive hypotension is beginning from neurosurgical setup and uh, this is a recent survey is conducted in USA and uh, Canada many SNAC uh, members were involved mm, they have actually most of them they have actually given uh, us they, they are practicing only in some aneurysm clipping and AVM surgeries and even then the most more than 45 percent of the individual they have uh, said that the mean BP was maintained between 60 to 40 during this permissive hypotension and the systolic BP was maintained between 90 to 100 millimeter of mercury. And another one of the strategies is stopping the antiplatelet and anticoagulate coagulation drugs in an appropriate time. So there are certain recommendations. Aspirin has to be stopped seven days, clopidogrel seven to 10 days, uh, warfarin five days, uh, direct acting oral anticoagulant 24 hours for low risk procedures and 48 hours for high risk procedure. If they have an abnormal renal function, it has to be stopped 72 to 96 hours. Um, before surgery. And what about reversal of coagulopathy? And there are certain, uh, many patients will be on different drugs. So certain guidelines needs to be followed. I'm not going to go through this whole slide. Uh, for example, if the they are on warfarin, it has to be corrected with the uh, three or four factor PCC, or if they have to be given, um, if it is not available, FFP has to be transfused at 15, 10 to 15 ml per kilo. If they are on direct acting um, inhibitors, uh, there is except dabigan Run, there is no other uh, uh, direct anti, uh, direct thrombin inhibitor uh, don't have a um, you know reversal agent so we have to administer um, activated uh, protein um, prothrombin complex that is about in 50 units per kilo uh, so when we uh, once we have uh, preoperatively uh, uh, evaluated and uh, then we have uh, predicted the risk factors, then we'll move on to the um, what all the uh, preoperative strategies we can utilize uh, to reduce the blood loss. Now we have to prepare just before the procedure what all the things we need to keep it ready. Inform patient consent and the need for ICU, need for ventilation has to be informed to the patient and adequate intravenous is the must and white bore cannulas we need and multi-lumen catheter, central vein catheter um, and warming devices, rapid infusion, pump and pressure 
bags, inotropes and vasopressor drugs to be loaded and collected close to the patient, adequate manpower and, uh, uh, you know, repeat communication with blood bank uh, doctors and arrange the uh, post-op ICU care. All those things are needed. So what are the monitorings do we do during massive transfusion? Uh, apart from the routine ASA monitoring, depth of anesthesia monitoring is mandatory um, because most of these patients actually will receive TIVA and uh, cerebral perfusion monitoring in selected cases uh, using cerebral oximetry or jugular venous oxygenation and non-invasive cardiac output monitoring or pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation has to be used for fluid uh, management and uh, renal monitoring by uh, measuring the urine output. And uh, apart from that, we need to do a repeat ABG and metabolic parameters because these patients are more prone for hypocalcemia, hyper and hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. And also we need to have a you know, frequent interval, we need to monitor the coagulation parameters, uh, prothrombin time, activated um, partial thromboplastin time, and uh, fibrinogen platelet counts have to be monitored. And now we are actually, there is a lot of role on uh, uh, viscoelastic hemostatic assays using TEG and Rotem. And then uh, platelet function monitoring in neurosurgery, it is not many, um, uh, you know, uh, studies have shown that uh, this is not utilized very often. Now, what are the goals of lab parameters during massive transfusion? Hemoglobin has to be maintained between 7 to 10 grams. INR has to be less than 1.5. PTT should be less than 42 seconds. Fibrogen should be more than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Platelet should be more than 1 lakh per microliter. The pH has to be maintained within normal limits. Code temperature should be more than 35 degrees. Degree, base uh, deficit should be maintained less than 3. Lactate, if uh, um, possible, it has to be maintained less than 2 millimole per liter. And it's uh, during the massive blood loss and blood transfusion, assessment of blood loss is uh, extremely important and it is also difficult. And uh, we have to see the gauzes, mop used, and uh, we, uh, suction bottle has to be uh, repeatedly emptied and it has to be measured. And uh, we have to look at the QSA where uh, the jar volume has to be marked. And and if they have used an irrigation, then we have to subtract the irrigation volume. And also sometimes surgical drapes are coming with collection bag. That collection bag actually can accommodate more volume. If we are not looking at that volume, we may miss uh, uh, massive blood loss. And keep a watch on, especially in pediatrics, keep a watch on irrigation fluid also. And we have to activate the massive transfusion protocol as early as possible because it has been shown that early activation of MTP reduces the morbidity mortality and also it reduces the best wastage of blood and blood products and improves the patient outcome and uh, decreases the mortality and morbidity. And whenever we transfuse, we have to go through these four factors in mind. Why we are transfusing? Is there a benefit is, uh, more than the risk? Or are we uh, treating the patient's symptoms or the lab values? Are we giving prophylactically or therapeutically? And what to transfuse? Are we giving whole blood or component therapy? How much to transfuse? How, how much to calculate? what is the type of surgery we are using and how to transfuse using a filter uh, and the rate of transfusion should not exceed more than 150 ml per minute and uh, warming should be done while transfusing. This is a general guide. Usually when the patient is having a hypovolemia of about 25 to 30%, we usually give crystalloid and colloid. When there is an inadequate oxygen delivery, we treat, uh, we transfuse uh, packed uh, RBCs. And with the patient having a PT-PTT rearrangement of more than 1.5 times normal, which corresponds to the coagulation factors of less than 30%. So we need to transfuse with, the, with them with the FFP and cryoprecipitate. Usually we give FFP of 15 to 20 20 ml per kilo, cryo one bag for 10 kilo. For children, if you take, it's about 5 ml per kilo. When the uh, platelet counts are less than 1 lakh, we uh, give platelets. Uh, so usually, um, we give PRCs a platelets uh, one unit per 10 kilo. In a children, it's about 5 to 10 ml per kilo. And uh, what to give and how much to give? There are two main um, important studies which were published in JAMA and JAMA surgery, prompt and proper trial. What they are actually predicted this higher volume of plasma and platelet ratio help uh, during an early resuscitation decrease the mortality during the first hour. And proper trial also um, showed that uh, more patients achieved hemostasis better and fewer experienced death due to examination by 24 hours. But there was no difference in mortality at 24 hours or 30 days due to any cause mortality was not different. 
and uh, it's a very very important institutional protocol to be followed prior to transfusion you have to ensure that you are transfusing the correct uh, blood into the correct patient and you have to check the compatibility labels and also you have to look at the bag look for integrity and uh, when was it collected when was that um, expiry date and what is that is there a radiation is used and uh, two people have to check and sign it before transfusion and uh, it has to be documented and I'm not going to, each institution has a massive transfusion protocol. This is the transfusion protocol we follow in our blood bank. And what is the role of, so when we transfuse uh, first round, usually if an unexpected bleeding happens, usually we uh, transfuse O negative and AB, AFFP, um, BK give second round four units of prbcs four units of ffp and one platelet pack will be given if the fibrinogen is less craig precipitate when the third round is going then we replace another volume apart from that if it is possible where there is a role for factor 7a we should give that and uh, what is the uh, evidence saying uh, role of factor 7a in neurosurgery it has been used in only in some reported cases of tbi especially in a penetrating injury are in patients with ICH and pediatric brain tumors and patients with hemangiopericytoma. But these cases where they have just only off-label use, it FDA recommendation is not, uh, is FDA is not recommending uh, of, um, for uh, factor 7a. And uh, only thing is before using a factor 7a, you have to remember that it does not work in patients who are acido, having acidosis. So pH correction and also the coagulation have factors minimum 30 percent of the coagulation factors have to be there. So before giving factor 7a, FFP, platelets, cryo has to be transfused. The dose of F uh, factor 7a is about 40 to 90 microgram per kilogram. Now, what is the evidence for viscoelastic testing, hemostatic testing in neurosurgery? The TEG and the ROTAM, the TEXTAM and FIFTAM are the uh, thing it's uh, coming up in uh, neurosurgical practice. It uh, 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 determines the uh, how how fast is the clotting is initiated and how is the clot is growing and is it normal strength or abnormal strength? Is it uh, holding together or is it dissolving? It is assessing all those factors. What is the advantage of uh, tech is turnaround time is very shorter. So uh, I, we can actually um, it takes because it takes less time. Uh, Will, along with the clinical assessment, we can do this and so that the decision making is faster. And also it detects the hyperfibrinolysis and platelet dysfunction, which cannot be measured using a conventional coagulation test. All phases of coagulation, primary, secondary, cross-linking of fibrin clot and its stability, all are assessed and it is performed in a patient's true temperature so that we can, um, you know, hypothermia induced coagulopathy can be picked up very early. And uh, in also it has uh, studies have shown that it reduces the transfusion recommend and need for blood transfusion. So this is a uh, paper published in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine. It is uh, definitely saying that uh, the rotum and uh, rotum guided um, transfusion decreased and picked up the hypofibrinogenemia better and it reduced the blood loss transfusion recommend and decreased the transfusion related cause. And what about the uh, other traumatic brain injury and other elective neurosurgical procedures? And this study has come compared the uh, Rotem and uh, TEG with um, PTPTT and shown that there is a strong correlation between these two. And uh, now this is a few slides on chemical chemostatic agent use. What is the anesthesiologist's role? Why we should know about it? There, we all know that this uh, use of adrenaline and bone wax is used to control the scalp bleeding and the bone bleeding. And uh, hydrogen peroxide is no more used, though it uh, acts by vasoconstriction because of the air bubble formation, it is no longer longer use. And the other uh, various factors like gel form, surgical cell, oxy, uh, oxy cell, uh, they are oxidized glucose, which is used uh, for achieving hemostasis and microfibrillar that is called avitin uh, and the flow seal, surgical flow, fibrin sealant and fibrin blue are used in neurosurgical practice. When you see a 
cell form, it absorbs the blood and it works by mechanical pressure. When we use surgicel and oxycel, it is an oxy oxidized regenerated cellulose. So it acidif uh, the acidity of the material reacts with the blood and it forms an artificial clot. So whenever we uh, put thrombin substitute over this, it does not work. So we need to know that when we use a surgicel and oxycel, we cannot use any thrombin uh, products. And when we use microfibrillar collagen, it is derived from the bovine dermal collagen. It actually causes platelet, it attracts the platelets, it increases the platelet adherence and causes release reaction. So it works by um, uh, causing the uh, increasing the primary hemostasis. So in, if you use this in a patient who is thrombocytopenic, obviously it won't work. So when we are using this, ensure that the platelet counts are uh, better. And when we use flow seal and surgi flow, both are uh, gelatin uh, and thrombin derived products. So which actually uh, causes uh, by mechanical pressure and also by causing secondary hemostatic effect. And when we use tisil, it is a component of both uh, fibrin and thrombin. Uh, component one contains uh, human fibrinogen factor 13 concentrate, and also it has an anti-fibrinolytic solution, a protein. And component two has a bovine thrombin. Both are actually mixed and it is uh, given along with calcium chloride. Fibrin blue, which has a cryoprecipitate and uh, factor 8 and calcium chloride and a proteinin and bovine thrombin. This is also used in a um, uh, for chemical chemostasis. I'm not, because of the time factor, I'm just not going through the massive transfusion induced complication, but every anesthesiologist should know the transfusion induced complication. Whenever there is uh, increased number of RBC unit transfused or storage time is increased or uh, the donor leukocyte is more the number it is present in the transfused blood, the more the problem. So you have to, there are various infectious immunological metabolic complication has been described and uh, there are various strategies are described in uh, literature uh, because of the time factor. I'm not going through that. We need to keep that in mind and we have to manage them appropriately. Take home with message, thorough preoperative evaluation and prediction of patients who are at risk for massive blood loss and transfusion and preparations are the essential key factor for preventing the morbidity, three Ps. Um, and also we have to utilize all the blood conservation strategies and it, the early institution of massive transfusion protocol and thorough knowledge about the blood and blood products and the complications help us to manage appropriately. Thereby, it helps in improving the patient's outcome. Thank you.